But the goal in these sermons and these services leading up to Easter isn't that you would learn new facts and say, oh, I learned something about the arrest or, oh, I learned something about the trial, but that you would reflect and be ready to celebrate the miracle of what happened. And so you may be asking yourself, why didn't we begin in Bethany? Why didn't we begin with the miracle of the feeding? Why didn't we begin with something happy? Well, that connects to these and connects to this story. What are these that I'm holding in my hand? Handcuffs. Every cop show and every lawyer drama you've ever seen has had handcuffs. It usually is at the end. Who do we usually lock up with the handcuffs? The good guy or the bad guy? The bad guy. In this story, there weren't physical handcuffs, but someone is arrested. And so in these next two weeks, as we begin thinking about Easter, we need to remember that this isn't just a sunny story. It begins with an arrest. It is a legal proceeding. And think about what this means. Your Lord, the Son of God, has a record. Now, don't raise your hand, but some of you do. Some of you know what it's like to have people look down on you, to judge you for a crime you were accused of. Some of you know what it's like to be put in handcuffs. Jesus would find it hard to get a job. He would have people look at him funny on the street. And we'll talk more about why that is and what it's for. But we need to know that at the center of Easter is an arrest. There's a trial and there's an execution. Easter is a serious holiday. Important things are happening. But there's something else in this story. There's, there's not actually physically handcuffs. So if you said, hey, pastor told me there's, there's handcuffs in John 18, uh, you're, you're misinterpreting. But there is something else in this story. What's this? Sword. sword. We had to put the children on this side of the stage by the frog because the sword was over here. You don't mix six-year-olds and swords. That's a bad idea. You don't mix them. But there's a sword in this story. This is actually a mock-up of a Roman sword. Uh, we have a, a church member here um, who has access to lots of swords. So anytime I need one, I just ask him. It's great. But this sword, we, we think of this as a novelty, as something to play with, something to say, ooh, that looks interesting. But in the ancient world, swords were considered self-defense weapons. They were considered the gun. You would conceal carry. It's what you use to defend yourself. And in this story, somebody discharges a firearm. They use their sword to defend themselves. This is a story where violence breaks out. Someone bleeds. Someone bleeds. So it is, a first of all, an arrest, but it's also a fight. Now, who discharges their weapon? What's his name? Peter. In Luke 22, we read that Peter... Uh, lashes out at the people arresting Jesus. I have a question. Is Peter a good shot? No, he's not a good shot. He, he was trying to defend Jesus. He was trying to stop the attack, and all he hit was an ear. If you're, if you're shooting in self-defense and you only hit your attacker in the ear, are you going to have a good day? No, no. But Jesus does something very interesting, which should mean something for us, and it should mean something for Easter. Many of us, our, our two favorite Christian holidays are either Christmas or Easter. And as those days approach, we hear about the things of God and we get excited and we, we're ready to rally and go into battle and say, I'm going to defeat something for God. I'm going to change the world. I'm going to do something big. I, I'm going to slay a dragon. But in this story, Peter says, I'm going to defend the faith. I'm going to defend my Savior. I'm going to reach out with my sword and attack someone. And what does Jesus say? Put away your sword. So we will feel big things coming toward Easter. But what Jesus wants, what he wanted from Peter, wasn't that we say, Jesus, I'm, I'm going to slay a dragon for you. 
It's I will obey you. Jesus didn't need Peter to fight for him. He needed Peter to obey him. Peter, put away your sword. And then last, what's this? The money, how much money? How much? Can you, can you see, Stacy? A dollar bill. A dollar bill. You know, it's just, just fold money, just a dollar. But sometimes uh, you'll see this in an establishment. You'll see it in a shop behind the counter, and it'll be posted on the wall. It usually means one of two things. It either means their first dollar, or it may have a sign under that says, the buck stops here. Which we say that, and we don't usually think about what that means, but it means something important for that shop owner. And that the origin of that phrase actually comes from whenever, uh, my understanding is whenever they were uh, out on the range and cowboys were playing poker. The way they indicated whose turn it was to, to be in charge of the game, in charge of shuffling, was the person with the with the, the knife, the buck knife in front of them. This could all be complete lies, I don't know, cowboy tales. But if you had the buck knife passed to you, it stopped here. And then I, I believe it was, it was popularized by President Truman. He, he made that part of his campaign slogan. But what I like about that idea, whenever you're at a shop, that means whoever put that dollar there says, whatever goes on in this shop, I'm responsible for it. I will take charge of it. And where that connects to this story, it connects to Peter and his sword, is that Jesus owns the responsibility for Jesus' disciples. Think about what's going on. On this side, we have Jesus and his disciples. Obviously, they're guys who, who don't always think with their, their frontal lobe. They make bad decisions sometimes. They're riled up. They're sleepy and grumpy and hungry. And then we have the military, the, the military guards and the people from the chief priests. They're sort of a mob, and they're coming together. And if, if Jesus wanted to get away, he could say every man for himself, get them all riled up and fighting, and then flee. But what do we read? He says, who are you looking for? And he says, I am he. And then even more so to, to demonstrate that Jesus is in control, that he takes responsibility for his disciples. Do his captors say, okay, we're going to get you now. They fall down. If Jesus wanted to flee, that would be the time. But instead they get back up and he says, are you here to arrest me? And he, he even goes so far as to say, of those... Oh, goodness gracious. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost not one. And Jesus, in the very last verse, says, put your sword in its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? So in our first reflection on Easter, we need to remember that first off, is this story a story about sunshine and eggs and bunnies? No, it's a story with an arrest, a trial, an execution. We also need to remember that it's a story where we may be tempted, like Peter, to say, I will do battle, I will slay dragons, but what does Jesus demand of his disciples? Obedience. And then lastly, we need to see in the story that Jesus owns responsibility for his disciples. He doesn't shift blame. Jesus would say, I'm the one responsible. The buck stops here. Now, the passage that Dottie read, is it a passage about friendship or a passage about denial? Denial. And I do want you to understand there is some historical importance in the story. It really happened. There really was a peasant named Peter who was rising in the ranks of his rabbi. And there, there really was a rabbi named Jesus who had just been arrested, as we just read about. And even as he was arrested, he displayed power. And the situation is, is that Jesus has been brought to the high priest's house. And John, the disciple, who's well-connected, has been let in. But Peter is outside. And, and most importantly, Peter isn't sure if anything he believes is true 
any more. He doesn't know about Easter yet. He thinks his world is crashing down. But what I need you to do today, and this is part of our reflection, is listen to this story through Peter's eyes. So just a, a silly thing to get you ready for this little bit of role playing you'll do in your head is everybody, you can put your hand on your face or you can put your hands together and say, me, Peter? Everybody say that. Me, Peter? And now if you imagine better with your eyes closed or imagine better with your eyes open, listen to this story through his eyes. It's dark and you're at a door, a big wooden door, bigger than a church door that you've seen. It's ornate. It's carved. And you want inside that door. But next to the door is a small girl. She's hardly a bouncer. You expect someone that would be guarding such an important place would have muscles, would have tattoos, but it's just a girl. She's lowly. She's meek. And most importantly, she poses no harm to you. And you, she asks you a question as you come to the door. She's there to screen entrance, and she asks you a very simple question. Are you also one of this man's disciples? She's talking about your friend that is inside. And you think about the question. Does she, is she just doing her duty? Does she know something? Is she trying to hide something from you? And then you think about the girl. She's smaller than you. She, she's frail. She looks sleepy. She poses no threat. And your big, strong fisherman, Peter, you could overpower her. You could just pick her up and set her to the side. She's not going to bounce you away from this party. But then you think, does this girl even matter? She's just the lowliest of servant girls. She has the night watch at the gate, and she's where nobody wants to be. I could just tell her I'm the pizza guy, and she would let me in. She doesn't care. It's okay to lie to small people, you tell yourself. It's okay to lie to people that don't matter. She's asked you, are you his disciple? And you say, no, I'm not. So you come through the door, and inside, like most of the Mediterranean homes you've seen, is a courtyard, and in the middle of it, because it's nighttime, there is a fire. There's a fire because people need to warm themselves. And you look at the fire, because it's the only thing casting off light, and you see people that look sort of dirty and lowly, like the servant girl, people that look like they've been working all day, temporary hired hands, but you also see people in nice clothes. They're wearing their ties. They're wearing their, their linen gloves. They look like the full-time servants, the ones who get let into the inner chambers, the ones that look like they are a big deal. And you think, I want to be by the fire. That is where the action is. And so you, you approach the fire, and one of the, the no-name servants, one of the ones that is obviously just a day laborer, not someone wearing a tie and fancy clothes, but just somebody normal, asks you with a, with a twinge of shame, you also are one of his disciples. Now, the girl at the door was just doing her job, but this, this servant means something. They mean something about you. They are looking down on you and all you want is to be by the fire you say i don't want to be shamed i'm peter I, i've been following around an up-and-coming rabbi i've had more prestige than, than i ever thought i would be thousands of people know my name i was there to help feed thousands of people after all john the disciple is inside why should someone look down on me this is just another lowly servant. You say, no, I am not. So now you get to elbow your way in. You try to get the good spot around the fire. You, you, you know whenever you're around a campfire, the smoke chases people around, right? It chases people around. You're trying to avoid the smoke, try to get warmth 
trying to be on the side of the fire next to the people that are dressed better than the day laborers. But then you see someone that makes your stomach feel heavy. It's, it's like whenever you're in a room and someone you haven't seen in a long time, but they know something terrible about you walks in. Someone that knows something you've done wrong. You, Peter, see someone that you attack. You see this guy and you say, I remember earlier this night, I made his cousin bleed. I drew my sword, I drew my gun, and attacked him. This guy knows something terrible about you. He knows you committed assault. And you hope he doesn't recognize you, but he does. And that person angrily, because he is ticked off at that guy from the garden. He says, did I not see you in the garden? Did I see you there at that fight? Did, were you with the people that made my cousin bleed? You don't feel shame. You feel fear. How you answer this person may start a fight. It is tense around the fire. And in your fear, you say, no, I was not. I'm not one of his disciples. And around the fire, you hear a rooster crow. So open your eyes. We imagine this story as Peter in both the arrest and the denial because it helps us prepare and reflect on Easter. Let's go to the last slide. What I want us to reflect on is obedience. The command from Jesus to Peter at the arrest wasn't, oh, Peter, fight for me, do amazing things, hurt people for me. It was, obey me. And then we just read a story about denial. And notice the reflection isn't, don't deny Jesus. That would be the, the normal thing to say. We just read a story about Peter denying Jesus. We should reflect on as we go to Easter don't deny Jesus. But here's the question. Was Peter unaware, was he unwarned that denying Jesus would be a bad idea? Did, did he know it was coming? Yes, and it didn't change who he was and what he did. So I can tell you don't deny Jesus, but it doesn't get at the heart. Why did Peter deny Jesus? even after Peter would say, I would never deny you. His Lord was arrested. Remember the handcuffs? His Lord didn't fight back. He'd seen his friends desert him. And even whenever it came time for the trial, Peter is an eyewitness. Peter should have prestige. He was the leader of the disciples. Who's invited in, John or Peter? John. Peter's on the outside looking in. He's even wondering if he matters anymore. His whole belief in Jesus is crumbling. It's falling apart. This Jesus was supposed to be king. It looks like the plan is failing. Peter drew his sword. He lied at the door. He lied at the fire. He lied to the man who confronted him because he thought Jesus wouldn't come through. He didn't trust Jesus. Before we deny Jesus, we stop trusting him. We say, he won't come through. I have to take matters into my own hands. Jesus can't get himself out of the trial. I'm going to have to lie to get closer. Jesus can't get himself out of this arrest I'm going to have to cut a man's ear off to save him. Peter didn't trust Jesus. So as we move towards Easter, those are our, our first reflection points. Are you obeying Jesus? What are his commands for your life? But even more importantly, do you trust him? Maybe this last year from last Easter has been very dark. Terrible things have happened. And you would say, it is 
hard. You're like Peter. You think the only way forward is I take, I take circumstances into my own hands. Or maybe you would be like Peter. You'd be so confident in yourself and say, I would never deny Jesus. Are you ready to trust him? Are you trusting in Jesus just because of your good circumstances? 